Hey everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to an episode of This Week in Music, shot live here at New Noise in Santa Barbara. And I have a very special guest today, uh, it's Mr. David Hyman. David is the CEO of MOG, um, and if you aren't familiar, you should be. You can go to MOG.com and listen to music for free, um, or sign up with subscription service and, and listen uh, online, on your phone, in your Mini Cooper soon, um, on your Sonos, uh, et cetera. It's a, it's, a, it's a gigantic catalog of music. Uh, and it's also, uh, it's, there's, there's, there's more to Mog than that. So we're going we're gonna to get into that with, uh, with David today. So David, thank you. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Can Coming you guys out. hear me? All right. So I'd like to I'd like to start by going back a little bit because you know before Mog you you did some other things uh, you were the CEO of Grace Note um, you know what what how, what's what's your path you've been involved in digital music since the really early days and why and like, what what drew you to it Well, I mean I think I became obsessed with how people interface with music um, going back to uh, when I was about 13 years old and I got my first like real stereo system. And, and the tools and the ways that you interface with the music in some warped ways became almost as important, if not more important to me, than the music itself, which is kind so of sad to say. So you were, you were a stereo nerd? You... I was a real audio nerd, yeah, audio equipment nerd, and worked in high-end audio stores on Long Island. I was, like, obsessed, and continue to this day as um, I kind of do mog to make the money to pay for my high-end audio equipment. It's like my sound and, and you, in, in the early days of Music Online, you were one of the co-founders of Addicted to Noise. I, yeah. I remember Addicted to Noise as really kind of the, the first, you know, legit music magazine on the web. Yeah. Um, I, I was at Hotwired, which was really, you know, for all intent and purposes, the first commercial website in 1994. It was a spin-off of Wired magazine. And... Um, well, a little background there. I was living in Sweden selling audio equipment. and Out of vans. Out of a van. Did you know that? I did know that. Yeah, so I would drive around a van all day and like sell speakers out of IKEA parking lots. It was a strange gig. Um, How was your Swedish? Were you, were you doing that in English? I could sell you speakers in Swedish right now if you'd like to hear it. I would actually. Sell me a speaker in Swedish. <laughs> So we're, that's right, folks. We're here today with yeah. David Hyman, yeah. who is a, he sells speakers out of a van in Sweden. David. And I'm here to teach you how you can sell speakers out of a van. Let's talk about where the probably, real money's at in the music business. the real business. way to make yeah. money in the music business. Yeah. Um, so, so this Rasta gave me a Apple laptop in exchange for a pair of speakers. And I got on the internet very early through the University of Uppsala. And um, I became obsessed. You know, this was like days of Mondo Magazine, which was kind of the pre predecessor to Wired. And I think some of it came out of my interest in the psychedelic experience. When I was younger, I followed the Grateful Dead for a long time. And so I was going to wear a Jerry t-shirt today. <laughs> Because I know you always wear a punk rock one, so I figured I should wear it. Yeah, you just all balance it off a little bit. Um, so the whole virtual reality kind of movement and was really starting to pick up speed there. Wait, when is this? This is this is like ninety two, ninety three. Right. And um, I started teaching myself how to mac uh, author macromedia director. I had this concept of creating CD ROM games. CD ROMs were still kind of cool back then. And so I moved to San Francisco to start a CD-ROM game company, taught, uh, took classes in director, went to Macworld Expo, and met all these people there from Wired Magazine who told me they were going to start the first ad-supported website. And at that very moment, I was like, that's the future. I'm like, of course it's going to be ad-supported. <laughs> Someone has to pay for the content. And I figured, well, gee, I was selling speakers out of a van. I'd probably be the right guy to sell those ads on the Internet. Um, it was a whole new concept and kind of vaporish. So is that what you were doing at How are your, your ad yeah, sales? Yeah, I mean... Um, so you're part of the very first ad sales team on the internet, really? I was part of the first. I might have sold the second ad. My boss sold the first one. And I was in the room when 
Rick Boyce and Jonathan Nelson from Organic invented the ad banner. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> so how did that then become uh, addicted to noise? So this guy, Michael Goldberg, who was a senior editor at Rolling Stone for 15 years, had this beautiful vision of starting an online internet magazine. It was really the first content-based music destination outside of Iuma. Yep. And um, it was an incredible thing. There's nothing like it today. The only parallel is Pitchfork, but I think it was much better than Pitchfork. In its, at its time. It had incredible rock journalists like Grill Marcus and Dave Marsh. Uh, Joey Ramone was one of our reporters. Um, it was incredible. Yeah, it was, it, was, so, it, it, was, it was great, and it was yeah. also before there was an audience for that great content, Yeah, for all intents and, and purposes. It, it was really, it was the first time you could read an album review and listen to the album while you read the review. Right. And so that concept in and of itself was revolutionary. Um, it was the first place in the world where there was daily music news. Never existed before. You know, the economies of scale never supported printed daily music news newspapers. Um, and uh, so I thought Michael Goldberg was brilliant, and I loved the idea, and I left Hotwired to go start this with him. And it grew to be, you know, one of the largest music destinations on the web. We merged with a site in New York called SonicNet, which was very complimentary to Addicted to Noise. SonicNet was all cybercasts and chats. It was kind of more of the interactive stuff. Um, they were broadcasting the Tibet Freedom shows. They were interviewing artists online like Bjork, and they had a lot of great artists. And we were editorially based. The two companies merged, grew to be the largest music site on the web, and MTV acquired us in the late 90s. And then you ended up working at MTV in marketing. Yep. Then I ran the marketing for MTV.com, VH1.com, SonicNet, which they ultimately killed. You know, they bought us to, to kill it, which is kind of sad. Um, and Nickelodeon, they threw in. Yeah. It's your demo. <laughs> yeah. How, uh, how did you make it from there then to Grace Note? Well, working at MTV was one of the worst experiences of my life. Um, you know, going from this like cool, small, fast moving thing to this bureaucratic beast um, where all of a sudden there was lots of politics and meetings about meetings and nothing ever seemed to get done. Um, and it was incredibly frustrating. So I knew it wasn't in the cards for me to stay there very long. They were actually making me move to New York and um, Guy from CDDB, it was called CDDB before I turned it into Grace Note. Yeah, tell people briefly yeah. who might not know what Grace Note was and then is. Right. Well, for those of you who aren't familiar, if you've ever used iTunes and stuck a CD in iTunes, um, Grace Note's the technology that identifies your compact disc and displays the metadata. There's nothing on a CD that says what it is. But magically, when you put a compact disc into iTunes, all of the names of the songs are there. And thank God, because when people rip CDs, you don't have to type the shit in. Yep. And, you know, it was a huge component to MP3 ripping and iPods before kind of cloud-based music happened. Um, I think it's safe to say that without Grace Note, iPods would have never existed because people would have never typed the stuff in. And so it was kind of a critical piece to every MP3 encoder in the world. Um, and we evolved beyond that to not just recognize CDs, but recognize digital files. Um, when I got to Grace Note, you know, I, I realized very early on in my first two weeks, well, this company's not very future-proof. CDs are going away. What are we going to do when they're gone? And so we developed technology to identify digital files, doing waveform analysis, which is kind of the predecessor to technologies like Shazam today. GraceNote actually powers a lot of the Shazam competitors. Uh, GraceNote, most people don't know it, but power um, Apple Genius and now the new um, Apple Music Match that they're using for their cloud-based service. Apple puts their own name on it, but it's all GraceNote. Yep. So 
coming back to you coming into Grace yeah. Note. So Grace Note was CDDB, the, the, the CD database. Yeah, I was running marketing for MTV, and someone from CDDB came to me and said, you know, we're the technology in all these MP3 players like Winamp, and um, we're developing a technology called the Grace Note Music Browser. The concept was every time somebody plays a song in an MP3 player, why don't we serve contextual information up in a browser window so that the moment someone's playing the Ramones, we can serve them all of this related Rolling Stones content from the web. And to me, that just completely blew my mind from a marketing perspective that you could identify the moment that somebody's listening to something and serve related content. I thought that was just the most incredibly powerful concept <laughs> as a marketer. And as the guy who was running marketing at MTV, I was like, well, this is a huge opportunity for us. You know, I just remember Backstreet Boys being really big then. <laughs> and I was like, you mean every time someone plays the Backstreet Boys, I can serve up the Backstreet Boys page on MTV uh, when their emotions are on their sleeve? It was just like a marketing wet dream. So how did, you, how did you end up going to the company then? So I got so obsessed with it, I started doing a deal between MTV and CDDB, and then they courted me over. Got you. And you, and you came in as, as what at Grace? As the no. president and CEO. Got you. When I got there, it was you know, a small um, engineering team, mostly, um, and they hadn't really had a business. So I was brought in to figure out what the business was. Right. And how, how, long, how long did you stay? Um, over five years, about six years. Oh. And yeah. the company ultimately, after you were gone, sold to Sony. Yep. Not so long ago. Yep. And and what did you what did you done in the in the interim between uh, Grace Note and Mog and starting Mog? Nothing. You went straight straight yeah. across. Yeah. I mean, what happened was I was at Grace Note, and we were kind of the leaders in music identification technology. And one day, I think it was 2004, um, I had discovered this app called Audio Scrabbler. And it was using music identification in a way that Grace Note wasn't, in a way that I thought was unbelievably revolutionary. And you know, next to seeing Grace Note, it was the second th next huge thing that kind of blew my mind. Uh, and the concept of Audio Scrabbler, which became Last FM, was and, and is really now what the Facebook music platforms mimicked after. It's true. <laughs> um, the concept was the ability to show other people what you're listening to through a web-based interface without having to type it in. So Audio Scrabbler was, a, and still is, a little app that you download, tracks everything you play in iTunes or whatever media player you happen to use, and displays it um, now at lastfm.com. You have your own profile page for other people to see. And so you just listen to music, and it all shows up there. You don't have to type it in, and it's a really amazing kind of virtual representation of who you are as a musical human being without you having to do the work. And yeah, what we always used to say, Rob, Rob Lord from, was, you mentioned Ayuma earlier and Winamp as well, we always used to say music is so special because it's intensely personal but not really private, right? It tells you a lot about somebody but you're not gonna steal my bank account you right. know, by, by right. knowing what I listen to in music. Right, I mean we used to say, you know, it's not spyware, it's myware. Um, and uh, so I said, shit, we got to start doing this. is like a whole new way to use music identification for the purposes of self-expression. You know, this is like, you know, people want to have these pages for vanity, like, like a blog. And it's also an, an incredible, incredibly powerful platform for music discovery, right? Because you were able to go there, type in an artist like Miles Davis and see who are the top Miles Davis listeners? Who's playing Miles Davis more than anyone and sort it in order based on frequency of plays? Go to those person's pages and see what else they're listening to as a vehicle for and springboard for discovery. And I just thought, this is the future of music discovery. So this was, so this was really the impetus for you to, to leave Grace Note and yeah. start Mog? Exactly. So, and what was Mog at the beginning? Because it wasn't then what it is now. Yeah, I mean, my. So what happened was, I reached out to the inventor of Audio Scrabbler and tried to hire him to come into Grace Note. And he was based in London, and he was ultimately courted by 
guys who happened to be in London, and I think it was just much more of a comfort zone for him. And they went on to create Last FM, and they had a great exit and sold the company to CBS. Um, but um, it became such a pa passionate concept for me that I was trying to get Grace Note to get into that space because I thought we could do it much better. Um, the early version of Audio Scrabbler was r kind of rudimentary, didn't work with all media player types, couldn't identify all file types, didn't scan the hard drive up front to get a full view of your collection. And so there were a lot of things that they were doing that I thought was wrong and I thought we could do better. Um, but ultimately it was decided that it wasn't in Grace Notes DNA. Grace Notes a B2B selling technology to other companies and not a consumer facing product. Um, but my background was in consumer facing products at SonicNet and addicted to noise. So I said, well shit, Grace Note can't do it, but that doesn't mean I can't quit and do it myself. <laughs> so I left Grace Note with this burning passion to build a better next gen audio scrabbler. And so our original view of MOG when we started it was giving people the best tools in the world to express who they are as musical human beings. So not just audio scrabbling type of tools, but music blogging tools. Yeah, I mean that's what I remember MOG as the beginning is a, is a is really a platform for music bloggers. So if here I am, I'm a big music fan. I'm a maybe I'm a I'm a tastemaker among my friends, but you're going to give me this this platform in a bigger stage. So first of all, you give me the tools to to express myself, and then you give me this kind of network where people can tie in and follow me. Is that is that what it was to begin? Yeah, I mean. You know, I thought it was going to be more discovering people through music than music through people. And, you know, while we started building it, two things were happening. Audio Scrabbler started getting a lot better. <laughs> and MySpace came out, which became this pretty big social network for, you know, discovering people through music. Um, and so when we launched, it was its own weird beast out there in the world that was doing Scrabbling better than Audio Scrabbler, but Audio Scrabbler had such momentum behind it um, that we didn't fully compete with it. Um, but what we did seem to do better than anyone else is give people the best tools for music blogging. And it really took off with hardcore music snob <laughs> aficionados who wanted to write about music all day. Um, and it became, I think, probably the biggest platform for music blogging. Um, yeah. And, and so how did it go from there, though, to what it is today? I mean, it, you know, tell, tell us what the business is today. I mean, obviously, the, the focus and the public focus is on the subscription side, but you guys have an ad network as well. Yeah. So what happened was, you know, we had all these profile pages that were showing you what other people were listening to. And you could go to their page and see the, their full iPod collection through a web-based interface. The problem was when you saw the metadata, you couldn't actually listen to the music. And it was incredibly frustrating for us. We felt like, you know, well, shit, what people want to do with music sites is, like, listen to music, and we don't have it. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You know, the, the magic thing you mentioned about Addicted to Noise was that you could read the review and hear the album. So now here it is 2000 whatever, and you're making people read the review and not hear the album. Right. And you would go to people's pages, you'd see what they were listening to, but all you could listen to was 30 second sound samples. We were mapping in data from AMG. And so we struggled for a long time to figure out how to get the music on Mog. We knew that we were building this better mousetrap for music discovery. Um, we knew that we were building this potentially great front end for music consumption, but we didn't have the music and we didn't have a lot of money. We certainly didn't have the money at the time to go get deals done with all the labels. Um, you know, at the time, you know, our perception was millions and millions of dollars in licensing fees, um, et cetera. So we, we toyed and debated for a while whether, whether we should go on the dark side and do something like some of these MP3 search engines like Project Playlist. And just, you know, wing it, do the do it for free, and try to find all of the music through an MP3 search engine, which one can argue is legal or not legal. Yeah, exactly. So so what you uh, what you could have done and just for folks that don't know what 
playlist did um, is you, the, the music is it's like Group Shark. There. Yeah, the music's out there somewhere. So we'll find it online and we'll make a link to it. And yeah, maybe that's no worse than Google is doing if you type in cert, right. cert and get a search result. And one could argue it's, it should be legal. It's protected under the DMCA. But every time somebody's tried to do this, they've been sued by the labels and shut down successfully <laughs> every well, I, single time i had you know we we have a, a friend in common lucas gons and i bought lucas had a had a company called webj right and when i was at yahoo we bought we bought lucas and we were not so politely asked to shut that service down by our partners at yeah. the major labels right 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 so you know fortunately we decided you know that's probably not a good move and um we partnered with a, an existing music subscription service called Rhapsody. They had just come out with APIs, and we thought, well, this would be a great proof of concept, right? We will tap into the Rhapsody API so that when you go to somebody's page on Mog and you're seeing what they're listening to, when you click on it, it'll spawn Rhapsody. And they had kind of a 25-song free version of the service. Our long-term plan was, we didn't want that to be the experience, but we wanted a proof of concept. And we knew if we did that, the world would start to see that we had this better mousetrap for music consumption. And so sure enough, we did that integration. Rhapsody agreed to do it. Um, and the Wall Street Journal wrote a big story, Walt Mossberg, reviewing this integration. And ultimately, the net net of the story was, if you want to use, Ma if you want to use Rhapsody, don't go to Rhapsody, go to Mog. It's a much better way to use Rhapsody than going to Rhapsody. So that was that was a major kind of turning point for us. So then how did how did you go from being this, you know, this, this music blog network in a way to being yeah. a, a very different beast today? So all of a sudden the record labels saw this and they saw that we were building a better way to consume music and some of the majors approached us wanting to invest money in Mog building a next generation platform for music consumption. I think, you know, their model was probably along the lines something of like a Hulu, right, which is partially owned by the labels, um, where we would be, you know, one of hopefully many sites that use them as a platform. They, their original concept was to build this back end called Total Music where they would be the repository of every song in the world, and they would provide it to anybody who wanted to build a music service. Um, it was very utopian. Uh, who, and was, who was leading It was that? run by the, these the renegade side. guys inside of Sony and Universal. I soon learned that they didn't have full support internally, but I had no clue. They were able to get money from who their was company. It? I'm, I'm curious. It was a guy named Dave Elner and uh -huh. Jeff Bronikowski yep. at Universal. And, and Scott Levine and Thomas Hessa at Sony. Yep. Um, most of them no longer exist in the labels. They're all gone. Thomas is so, still there. Yeah. The rest are gone. So it was a beautiful vision. They were like, we're going to give everybody music. You want to build a cool little app? We'll give you the music. We'll be the back end. We'll host and stream all the files. And, and their, their vision was so utopian that they were just going to give us all the music and do and make it all ad supported on demand. Wow. So no subscription like Mog today and Spotify, totally free, on demand, and any ad revenue we got, we were gonna just sh share with them. And we were like, where do we sign up? Yeah. So wait, you're gonna give us all the music, we're not gonna have to pay you any licensing fees, you're gonna invest millions of dollars in the company, and anything we sell, we're just going to give you some of the rev the ad revenue. This is incredible. Well, and, and I have to say, it's actually, I mean, it's it's kind of, I can't think of a more progressive idea that has come out of the labels in, in digital music. So yeah. these guys deserve yeah. some credit for going yeah. all the way there and for yeah. having this, there's this moment in time when everyone to <laughs> recognize, moment yeah. in time when this where there was a massive bit of innovation uh, attempting to come out of these two major labels. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I think their model was instead of taking a big piece of a small pie, let's take a tiny piece of a massive pie. Let's try to monetize all consumption. Because right now, if you think about the record labels, how much music consumption that goes on in the world are they monetizing?
teeny. I can't, can't even fathom. I mean, they're that. not getting paid for <laughs> FM radio. They're not getting paid when you play in iTunes. Just they're not getting paid when you play music, in the car. Peer yeah. networks, torrent apps. I mean, whatever. And so, um, we started to build Mog against this back end that they were building. And we spent, you know, after that first implementation of that we did with Rhapsody, we knew that was like not even a one point, oh, that was like a point five. And we spent the next year and a half just really building what we thought was the best front end for music consumption in the ever that ever existed. And it would be free and on demand. And so around end of 2008, the economy collapsed, right? Like totally collapsed. <laughs> and it was January 09 and I got a phone call and they were like, Hey, um, that back end we were going to give you, uh, we killed it. The whole project gone, and we've just like all lost our jobs. Wow. Yeah. And we're like, who, who was building that back end? Where was it being done? I mean, they it, bought a company called Ruckus. That's right. Um, for 10 million bucks. Um, some of it was in Chicago, some of it was in was that Jason the Hersk South. Herskowitz? What's that? Who was, who was Ruckus? I hate Herskowitz. to say, but I actually forget their names. Uh, I was funny. curious. Yeah. Um, so we were like, well, wow, we just built the best front end for music consumption in the world, but we have no back end. So what do we do? Like, do we just sit on it? And we were like, we have to get this out to the world because this is, you know, this is better than anything else out there. And so um, we decided to turn it into a music subscription service. And um, which meant you now have to go get the deals. With we the had labels. to get all the deals done. Yeah. But, you know, Sony and Universal, they're like, we're real sorry. We killed your back end. We'll make it easy for you. We want this out in the world. And, you know, the beautiful thing is we went to Warner and EMI and all these other guys. We showed them what we built. And we were like, look, we haven't really raised any VC funding yet, so I can't pay you your normal, like, millions of dollars. I'm like, but look what we've built. Do you want this in the world or do you not want it in the world? Wow. And when they saw it, they were like, this is the best thing there is. So we will figure out a way to cut licensing deals with you that work. Wow, that's a kindler, gentler music business was, you're telling us about. It was. I mean, you know, like I say often, every day they're a little bit easier than the day before. And it's been that way for the last three years, you know. We just launched a free version of the service, which if you guys haven't used is incredible. And um, I think it's the best on-demand free music service in the world. Not do I just say that, but in the last two or three months, there have been... 10 or 15 shootouts in the press, we won them all. Wow. Uh, it is a great service. I, I use it personally, and, and the, um, I, I thought it was really amazing that you guys managed to get that free service out the week before F8. So if, you know, I, I'll, this is my bit of commentary for a second. The world changed this year, right? Um, you know, we've all been, you know, the way, the way I like to point it out is, you know, the web has come up this distribution curve over the last 15 years where first there were portals and, um, you know, then there was, there, you know, search with Google and now there's social distribution and music has been kept out of all of that evolution because the rights weren't there. I mean, to your point, you create a great music site, you still don't have music on it. Um, and now this year, it's all there. We've got, I mean, what is Mog if it's not a portal for music with a search bar, with social distribution, right? So, um, you know, I think that, uh, and, and that really all got unlocked in a big way on a pretty big stage at F8 just a couple of months ago um, when they announced the integration between the streaming services, um, of which there are really four, right? There's, there's Mog, Spotify, RDO, and Rhapsody. Um, and, uh, and they, you know, you guys all have, um, they've really given a place for you to be integrated, but, but right the week before that came out, you guys managed to go live with a completely free service. I mean, that, that must have been quite a race to try to hit that date. Yes, it was. I mean, well, it was a little more than that. I mean, Facebook came to us and said, you know, at the time we were credit card up front to get into the free trial like Netflix. The reason we did that was we didn't have a mass platform 
uh, and a huge funnel to just bring people into a free trial that wasn't credit card up front. And have this massive distribution platform. Our every you know what's happened. I haven't seen it. I mean, Facebook audio scrapper was doing everything you play on Mog or any of the music services. All of the songs you play are just automatically showing up on your Facebook page and in your feed. Um, and so that concept of what you play is an awesome vehicle of self-expression and who you are as a human being is now being realized on your Facebook page, yeah, which so is rightfully the right home for it. That's the thing, is it's connected to, I mean, when I was scrabbling to Audio Scrabbler, the audience from my scrabbling was very, very small, and now you've got, you know, an, an audience of 700 million plus, uh, potentially, for, you know, for your, your, your music, your music habits, that music identity, really. And, and so, you know, the way this works is, you know, you play a song on Mog, and, you know, what instantly happens is there's a link on your Facebook page that says that you just listened to that song with a play button next to it. And your friends can now come to your page, see what you were listening to, click those play buttons, and it instantly spawns Mog and starts playing the song with no friction, no authentication, no registration, and totally free. Um, and it's revolutionary. I mean, it's completely changed our business in the last 30 to 45 days whenever it launched. Yeah, I saw an article, Elliot, is Elliot here somewhere? Elliot wrote an article about you guys being the fastest, the fastest growing uh, on, on Facebook at the moment. Yeah. Why, what, why would that be? You know, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we really built it as a next generation on-demand service. Um, where Spotify is this 60 meg client application that you have to install, ours is web-based in, in HTML5. So when somebody sees that play button and clicks, it just launches Mog and starts playing instantly. If someone sees a Spotify play button, they click it, and then they hit a wall where they have to install a 60 meg application. Um, and I think there's a lot of difference there. I think the other differences are tied to the fact that we put in an incredible amount of discovery tools. Um, and we can actually give a brand new user instant personalization. So let's say you see your friend was playing uh, a Radiohead song. And the little play button is there on Facebook, and you click on it. And all of a sudden, you land on Mog, and that Radiohead song starts playing. Immediately, what we can give you is personalized recommendations based on data we're sucking through the Facebook API, they actually tell us all of your artist likes. So we can get that from a brand new user and leverage that to give a brand new user an immediately personalized experience that encourages them to start listening to music. Yeah, I, and, ha I have to say, I mean, that's, that's what I noticed when I was getting into the UI. It was, you know, because I, you know, I, here I was a brand new user on the, on the web client and um, you're telling me already, you know, here's some recommendations for you, and they were really good. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute, you don't have enough of my data to get me these things that, you know, to give me recommendations that are this good. And then I finally I figured out, oh, these are from artists that I've liked yeah. on Facebook, and you're building my, you know, you've got a great solution to the cold start problem yeah. um, because, you know, you've got a little bit of data to work with. And we start to improve those recommendations as you start to play music on Mog. Um, so where was I headed? I don't know. Well, let's let's talk about. I want to talk about the the streaming, um, you know, business generally. Um, you know, we we've heard a lot lately that that you know we've heard you know Coldplay is not going to you know put their album in through the streaming services. Neither is Tom Waits. You've got some labels pulling their their uh, their pieces off. And you know, I've done the math. There was a great story in in Rolling Stone last week um, or the week before, I guess, outlining some of the math. And uh, you know, I, I think that what's what's interesting to think about is there is a, a, a fundamental change in value from the CD to, digi to, to digital downloads, there was a fundamental change, and from digital downloads to streams, there's a fundamental change. I mean, it takes about 100 streams to get this, from an artist perspective, to get the same revenue as selling one download. Um, 
and you know, and, and we all know that the average number of listens on any track is not a hundred, um, you know, per per artist. So it, it seems to me that that you know the bet that the music industry needs to be making is the one that you mentioned earlier with Total Music, which is that we need to grow the number of people who are paying for music overall. Yeah. Um, so you know, what, what what's your opinion of a the artists that are coming out, and b how do we scale streaming music to be gigantic? So, I mean, I kind of look at it at a real macro level. Um, the average iTunes consumer today is spending about $40 a month on music. I'm sorry, $40 a year on music. So that is about $3 and something, 12 cents a month. Um, and out of that, you know, Apple's taking a piece and the labels are probably getting 60 to 70% of that three dollars and twelve cents right um now every time someone subscribes to mog you know if they take our mobile option it's ten bucks a month well that same percentage is going back to the labels you know it's sixty to seventy percent right and so sixty to seventy percent of ten bucks is a lot better than you know the three dollars and twelve cents they get from an itunes consumer so you know the challenge is, you know, how do you get scale, to your point? How do, you get, how do you make it huge? You know, I think ultimately where these things are going to go, there's, I think there's a few different things happening. But, um, you know, the holy grail for us is getting these integrated into your cable bill and, you know, your carrier bill. You know, every month, you know, whether I watch it or not, ESPN's getting like three bucks from me out of every cable bill, whether I watch it or not. Um, and the holy grail, I think, for the music industry is, you know, if this was integrated into your cable bill or your ISP or carrier bill, there's this concept of breakage, right, where the labels have said to me, you know, Dave, if you can get a Comcast deal, we'll go much lower in our, in our price. They'd probably go as low as two bucks to three bucks um, for all you can eat, including mobile. Um, because the scale would be so huge, right? And so you've got it baked into your cable bill, and if you think about it, if the labels were to get $2 from every person who has a Comcast subscription, that's a lot better than getting $3.12 from the people who buy music and iTunes. Which is, a relati which is relatively people, a small. Most people who have Comcast aren't spending anything in iTunes, right? right? And so... I think that's where it needs to go. I think, you know, the other big... Are you here to announce a Comcast deal? I wish. I wish. From your lips to God's ears. Um, I think um, what we're going to see in the next three to five years is a real sea change in the car space. Um, you know, right now you've got 20 million people a month in the United States paying for satellite radio. That is, you know, people spending $15 a month for 150 radio stations. We're coming to the car with every album and song in the world on demand and 15,000 radio stations that are really better than Pandora because we don't have to adhere to any DMCA restrictions. Um, you can save songs from the radio. You can see the queue. You can jump ahead in the queue. You can listen to real artist-only radio, not just artist-inspired radio. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> um, and so I think that's a huge opportunity. We just announced a partnership with BMW and Mini. We're starting this month. All new BMWs and Minis are offering Mog built into the car. Uh, we've closed some other big car deals that we haven't announced yet, but we're going to announce at CES. And so I think that satellite business is really ripe for disruption. And it's not just 20 million in the US, you know, satellite was never able to launch in Europe or Asia because it was too cost prohibitive to launch the satellites. So there's at least a 3x multiplier on that 20 million number as kind of a, I think a bottom floor to where subscription music can be. Right, and that's the car alone. What about the living room? You guys are integrated with Sonos. What what else? What happens next there? You know, the living room's an interesting space. We've we've done deals where we're now integrated into all the new Samsung, LG, and Vizio televisions. 
Um, I'm, I'm less bullish on it. Um, I think there's a place for it. And I think people like me, you know, I have a dedicated listening room in my house. You know, I'm spinning vinyl every night. Um, but I think for, so, for the majority of consumers, it's really the car and portable where consumption happens. Um, we've done a beautiful 10-foot UI for the television. Um, and I'll just be honest, I have a boxy in my living room. I can access, access Mog through it. But I don't really personally like to turn the TV on and use a remote every time I want to listen to music. I find the challenge of the current input mechanisms of, of a remote control hard to type the metadata in. Um, and I just find myself gravitating to um, my iPod with AirPlay that I beam over to my stereo. And that's what my whole family does. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So what's, so what's next from I'm bullish on AirPlay. <laughs> so I think, I think having the UI in your hand and beaming that over to um, whatever home entertainment system you have is what's Mog's role there? How do you guys fit in? We've that? got AirPlay built into our iPhone app, our iPod app, and so you just start using Mog on your iPhone or iPod. You push one button and it just starts playing out of your stereo or out of your Apple TV or your Airport Express, and it's awesome. Um, we've actually just came out with a desktop app um, that's got AirPlay built in. So what are what are all the user endpoints? You've got a web app. You've got mobile app on on uh, iPhone and I, Android, iOS and Android. So iOS includes yeah. the iPad as well. Yeah. Um, you're you and you're you're integrated into. So you've got a car. Yeah. You've got a television. Yeah. You've got. Uh, you used to have a Chrome app. Does that still exist? Yep. Okay. So you got a a native browser based. Yeah. You have a desktop app. Yeah. Well, the Chrome app and the desk. The Chrome app and our web app are now one and the same. Okay. It's, the beautiful thing is we're, we're really trying to do everything in HTML5 now where we can write once and publish in all these different places. So most of the TV implementations we've done are HTML5. So the back end is the same. We're just changing the presentation layer, and it lets us develop for a lot of platforms with a really small team. And then how many integrations do you have with devices like Sonos? Well, we've just done a, a Logitech one, Samsung, LG, Vizio, Google TV. Um, there's probably more. You know, I think the whole value to cloud-based music services is if you're paying a subscription, you want that accessed everywhere. I mean, that's the value. You want to be able to have your music in the cloud, your favorites, walk into your car, and everything be there um, on your mobile phone, wherever you go. And so we really strive to be everywhere. We're, we're running out of time, and I do want to get to a couple questions. Before before that, I want I, I, my, the last question I want to ask you is, you know, just tell me why. So why should I? I've got these four sub services out there. Um, they all have relatively the same catalog. There are catalog differences, but you know, if I'm a consumer, how the hell do I choose one over the other? I think you should try them all. I mean, you know, we we're very confident that. Our service is the best. USA Today just did a shootout comparing us to Spotify, to RDIO, to Rhapsody. We won. Um, this, I'd urge you to go to this website called computeraudiophile.com. This guy did like a full-on anal probe. Of, I saw that one. <laughs> I mean, it's like you've never read anything this in-depth in your life. It's, it'll take you hours to read it. Um, and we won across the board. And so I think at the end of the day, it comes down to well, three things. One is sound quality. We have the highest resolution, resolution audio of any of the services. We're the only ones that do everything in 320 kilobit per second audio. And, and mostly it's ease of use and discovery features. We put a huge, huge emphasis on that. Um, and, you know, it's free now. So I'd urge all of you to go to mog.com and use our free on-demand service. Music music for free it's awesome so let's take some questions who has who has questions for for dave are you already uh teamed up with cd baby so you know when i have my cd baby account as a small musician it's already going to rhapsody and spotify automatically I haven't noticed them partnering up 
Is my music available already on Mog? I'm sure it is. Okay. Grab your phone and find out. Yeah, <laughs> I could. But uh, yeah, it, it, it should be. I mean, you guys. You yeah, we guys... have TuneCore. We have everything. It's it's 13 million songs now. It's actually a larger catalog than Spotify has for the U.S. Uh, question: How uh, of those? What, what's the curve look like on those 13 million plays? I mean, there's you must have a. I mean, how of those 13 million? How many get played in a given month? I honestly don't know. I mean, we're so busy. We're like you know, chickens running around with our heads cut off. We just don't have the time to analyze the data like that. And so I can only imagine there is a real 90-10 rule. And um, I think what I think is I think that some grad student out there yeah. should, uh, should call you tomorrow or, or after they watch this on video, and, they should, and this should be their, their, their the, the, PhD The problem is they're going to ask us to dedicate engineering resources to find that out for them. Uh, I'm just going to give, give them, just gonna give them a login, some sugar shell yeah. access. And that would be, be cool. Fine. Yeah. That would be All right, cool. next question. If, what, if any, barrier do you think the ownership issue presents to the uh, adoption of streaming? And what I mean by that is, you know, if I sign up with Mog for a year and end up paying, you know, $120 or whatever the subscription fee is for a month and then I quit, at the end of it, I have no music anymore. Whereas if I had spent that all on some on any of these other models, whether it be downloads, CDs, whatever, I have that. And this this kind of affects cloud music more generally. But you know, how big is the ownership issue? Is yeah. it an issue anymore? And what what do streaming services do about it? It's a really good question. I think um, you know, we we ask ourselves that every day. I think at a high level, you know, if you're the kind of consumer that's spending seven to ten dollars a month on music and you think you're going to be that kind of consumer for the rest of your life you'd be insane not to switch because for seven to ten bucks what are you getting today you're getting one album on mog for seven to ten bucks a month you get every album and song ever made all you can eat and on demand so you'd be nuts not to switch it is a mental leap that people need to take because they're used to possession Right, but um, you just you're you're the loser, you know. I, all the music that I've bought, thousands of dollars, are CDs sitting in storage now because I just use Mog. I don't even touch them, except for bootlegs. The one that's got the buzz. Um, I'll trade with that one in a sec. Will you hand me that mic? Get rid of the buzz. Sorry, I was just going to say the, um, uh, no, you're sick, dude. Um, the, uh, you're one of those Purell people, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to take a shower after this. Now, the, um, I think also, you know, coming from adding the, the topspin point of view to the streaming service is if you, if you think about, you know, kind of the, the unbundling of music that's happened from the CD to the digital download now to subscription services, I think as a music fan, you're crazy not to have a subscription service, but I think that there will be those few things over the course of a year that you fall in love with and you will buy the vinyl, and you will buy the t-shirt, and you will go to the show. And those things are, are where you will satisfy our, our sort of human need for ownership, because ownership of digital files is not really that attractive yeah. from an ownership perspective, yeah, there's no, relatively speaking. Yeah, but I, I average, I hate to say it, I'm embarrassed to say it, 150 to 200 a week in vinyl purchasing. Yeah, and I, I think that's so, right. And I think when you combine something like Mog with, with um, the kinds of things that, that artists can sell direct, which are, which are special, that, you know, that's a great, it's a great combo. I'll tell you, the best thing as a vinyl collector is I have eBay open in one window, Mog open in another. I can listen to everything before I decide what I want to buy. Well, and, and I think it's really interesting. You know, I, one place I've been thinking of it is if you think about that funnel where, you know, you're, you're got people that are unaware and you're making them aware and then they become fans and then customers and then evangelists. Um, a great thing about Mog is it's not necessarily at the bottom of that funnel the way a CD purchase was. You know, there is, it is very much in the realm of building awareness. You know, you, like you said, and you've been saying from the beginning of our talk, it's, it's, it's fundamentally different from iTunes because it's actually a music discovery 
service where you can listen to everything, and it puts it at a fundamentally different place in that funnel, I think. Yeah, I mean, one huge difference is, you know, in the world of purchasing, you were always worried that you'd get burned for buying the wrong one. Like, you'd buy it and you'd be like, shit, I don't really like it. I only like two tracks on this. There's no loss. You don't have that feeling of, I got burned, because you have it all. And that, that alone really changes how discovery happens. I have to say, I mean, just as a music consumer, I've been a record collector since I was five years old. And that, that is, is such a fundamental change to me. I used to love going to Aquarius Records in, in San Francisco, if you guys have ever been there. But it's such a great record store where they've got, you know, they write little paragraphs about every album and stick them on the outside. Um, and, and, and I love it. And there's something that I love so much about what they do. But I have gotten burned, right? Because, you know, the guy behind the counter, that's his favorite shit. And then you got suckered into it and you take it home and you're like, I don't yeah, love this. Yeah, it happens this. to me at Aquarius all the time because you're in there and you feel cool. And you read those cool descriptions and you kind of go out of your comfort zone. And yeah. you're like, yeah, this is too far out of my comfort zone. Exactly. Well, then, I mean, do you remember, I'm sure you guys remember this. As a kid, you'd listen to an album over and over even though you didn't like it. Just you'd listen to it until you did like it. Because, you, God damn, you spent like that was half the money you had on it, right? That was um, like me with cigarettes and beer. I yeah. didn't like either of them. And I just right. kept doing it until I finally liked it. Yeah. So, all right, let's take a, one, more, one more question and then we got to go. Um. Well, sorry. Well, hold on. Let's let's do two more. This guy here and guy. Yeah. Oh, we we we're, we're, we'll get them both done. We'll get them both done. Right. Thank you, man. Good. I have so six minutes. I'm thrilled to hear that uh, you're streaming in 320 bit files. Uh, I'm an engineer myself, and one of my biggest things about the whole music music industry has just been the the trashing of audio. And I think you feel the same way. <laughs> and so it's uh it's exciting to hear and with uh, especially on a production side, like everything's going up this next year to 32-bit, what we're doing, and it's going to be up at 64-bit and pretty soon. How do you see the limitations of the Internet and streaming? Um, can it overcome the size of files, and can it grow to even better to become more hi-fi and more of an experience like when you play your vinyls? Um, you know, my, my goal and dream for MOG is for it to be lossless. And I feel like it's about three to five years away that we might be able to do that. Um, you know, with lossless codecs, you can get kind of like two to one compression on an original CD with zero loss. It, it kind of converts back to the original file. Um, you know, we'd probably have to charge a little more for it because of the bandwidth costs. But I think so many people would be willing to pay. I know I would. Um, and it, it does make a huge difference. You know, it's, it's the difference of, I'll start getting teary-eyed and emotional here. But I mean, when you listen to really compressed music, it just doesn't do anything to you. It's like background noise. There's dynamic compression. Um, all the space and, and silence between the notes is just doesn't exist it's like a black hole and you feel it and you know people come to my house and they listen to like my stereo system where I'm often streaming better than CD quality 96 kilohertz 192 kilohertz files there's a great website called HD tracks where you can download music that's even higher resolution than CD you just need the right DA converter to decode it um, and you just discover music and hear songs on albums that never did anything to you before, but all of a sudden you're like, this is awesome. This song's incredible. And I, I think there's definitely going to be a movement on, on the sound quality side. Um, you know, there, it's, it's coming. It's rumored that, that, you know, that Apple's headed that direction. Um, you know, and obviously the technology will, will just, will just continue to, to keep up. And remember the great thing, you know, the, the, the reason that we have an opportunity to have great, um, sound quality in the future is because the internet really just allows for more consumer choice. You know, sound quality has lost, whether it was, you know, it's lost time and time again, you know, whether it's the, from the 78 to the LP, there was a loss in quality. LP to cassette, there was a loss in quality. We can argue about um, about CD. Um, but the reason is, is those are mass market products. But now we can have things like HD tracks for those of us who do care about the quality. And there is you can have a market that might not be a mass market, but is still a market. So let's take one more question, and then we'll let Dave get back to the airport. I was just wondering if you could say uh, just a little bit more about the 
possible long-term impact of streaming services on um, artists, revenue, bands, songwriters, things like that? Yeah, you know, again, I think, I think it's, you know, we're in this weird transition phase right now, but, you know, if if you had these services at an, a low enough price point that you could have real mass adoption, it's more money than they're making today from iTunes. You know, the average iTunes consumer spending three dollars a month, and I think it's going down. I don't think it's going up. Yeah, I think it will go down before it goes back up. But that has partly to do with the transition phase. You know, the other difference. But, but I think it's worth saying. I mean, as 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 Dave said, we're definitely in a transition phase. My 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 commentary, which uh, you know, David might might not agree with or be willing to say, is the 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 you know total revenues for recorded music industry will continue to decline for the foreseeable future until these services get scale. Um, and and start to take us back up, but that I mean I think that's the curve that's going to happen. The question is how ugly will it get between now and then? Yep. All right, that's All a great right. note to wrap it up on. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys so much. Um, you can watch this week in music every week at thisweekend.com/music. You can you go there and you can subscribe to it on iTunes. Um, you know. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and all that good stuff, and, and please uh, be a part of it and tell a friend. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And thanks, New Noise Santa Barbara, for having us. Thanks, David. Thank you, guys. That was great. Uh, there's a panel ongoing right now in the other room about where to get uh, money, so that's always a good panel. Um,